This is the place. I've been on a boat trip down the Nile, and it might sound superficial, but one of the things I liked most was the contrast between dry and wet. At least in that location, the notion of travelling too far from the river can give you shivers. I like that these two are communicating, not just based on their names. Sheep has been shown to have quite a level head, expressed mostly through relating information and experiences, while Dog is there to ask questions about everything. Also, if Dog had been piecing together what we've been told, like we have, the puzzles are there as sort of a basic foundation of human curiosity, upon which the more nuanced layers of free will and philosophy can sit. Yes, the context might not be entirely satisfactory, but it does exist. This puzzle doesn't have anything we haven't seen before, apart from a feeling of being trapped. Some minor administrative detail then? The robot running towards us at the end of Hub B1 was another serious Sam reference, I should know better by now. There are these exploding men that run towards you while screaming, which I choose to think and may have been intended to be interpreted as leftover assets from the engine before it was adopted into this game, which has either sprung back up awkwardly through random chance or by Milton's doing. All of the sigils in this hub are this golden colour, which are used solely to unlock new devices. I'm not sure whether any of them are skippable, but presumably the red ones are if you choose not to go up the tower. And at least in the first temple, the red one seemed a bit more difficult. So the game's got this multi-tiered difficulty scaling. All around, pretty clever and considerate. And I know I can't fully appreciate it being a completionist myself, but I'm sure some people really relied on that fact. That large moon. You can't put it all down to fictionalisation. There is an optical illusion with the moon, where it appears larger near the horizon. I'm not going to graffiti an obelisk, I'm not a monster. That's a nice feature, we can talk about the things we've done. I can't remember whether I've mentioned, but the messages that you write do appear to those in your Steam friends list. So if I had any Steam friends, they could have seen me talking about axes without any clue what I was referring to. So the name of this room is Moonshot, so guess what the first thing I did was? Pretty awesome. Doesn't actually let you solve the puzzle in this room, since there's only one connector. And here's me stumbling into secrets again. I prefer easter eggs that aren't too obscure. Although I felt kind of awkward here, it was taking forever, I just wanted to get on with things. But when the entire moon is rotating in front of you, wandering off and doing something else, it's not really in the cards. That's about it anyway, it's the Aperture logo. Portal reference, I think it shows a lot of confidence by the game creators. It's harder to make the comparison when the game beats you to it. Of course that only works if the game's any good.
I still had to kind of sidestep out of the way while maintaining eye contact. It's like someone stopping in front of you in a deserted street, putting down a mat and springing into a breakdancing routine. You can't just walk away, leave them to it. They were doing it for you. You just gotta look like you're enjoying yourself and wait it out. So boxes in the Talus Principle have a kind of inherent power of stability. Predictable, reliable boxes. I thought there'd be more to do, but then there's just this second box over here. Still, it's nice to know there is a chance in the future of launching a laser back and forth across the room. There is an option, I should mention, for having connectors retain the things they're connected to when you pick them up. So when you put them back down, those connections will continue. I was a bit on the fence. On the whole, it seems like it might open up solutions that wouldn't otherwise exist. And I do want to show the intended way if possible, curiosity notwithstanding. I think all in all, it would make it harder to follow what I'm doing. So that's mainly why I'm not using it. What I am doing, though, is demonstrating places to jump to. I suppose because I'll never stop being amazed at what I'm allowed to do. I had a look around, as if to say, yeah, I could jump onto the wall over there and walk straight to the sigil, but I've chosen not to. Though, in reality, the other wall is slightly too far away. I keep having these dreams. Great empty cities. Silent roads stretching for miles. The earth from space, all dark. Not a single light to guide me home. But if someone really came from another world... What would the Earth look like to them? A wilderness? A wasteland? I don't think so. Even after thousands of years, they'd see a world shaped by our hand in every aspect of its being. They'd see the cities and the roads, the bridges, the harbors. And they would say, here lived a race of giants. These dreams, they scare me, but... They also remind me that we built all of this. This room again, man on the moon, completely unrelated to the puzzle. Alexandra there, taking comfort in the legacy of the human race as a whole. I guess the apocalypse is a pretty good unifying force. If we're going to think about things in terms of us and them, why not think about us in terms of humanity, and them in terms of whoever comes next? or whoever travels here from afar. Yep, that's right. Just blundered into that solution. This is my bemused face. To my immense discredit, I didn't try and see whether I could blow a fan into the air. I'll try it next time, though I imagine the results will be boring. I found a pile of rubble. Also this key, but I was looking for a pile of rubble to stack this box on top of. Do some more climbing around. I also saw this thing up here. I forgot all about my attempts to boost myself through semi-conventional means. If you follow the pillars around, you'll see there's... there's sort of a path, if I'm feeling generous. So excuse me a moment while I make a detour towards an almost entirely inaccessible object typically used to aid the observation of objects more inaccessible than itself. Which is actually true. We are talking about the moon here. Call this, say, 15 tries later. Yes, I can see the sigil was there. Sometimes sequence breaks aren't worth it. Mm -hmm. 
Hey, it's Wheatley, on the moon. He's doing well for himself, making that logo and all. There's a question that's probably already been asked on the XKCD What If series. What if you shaved off half the moon? Well, probably global annihilation. It's usually the case. He did one recently, answering the question, what if the moon turned into a proportionally dense black hole? The answer is marvellous. Not much. Things would get a bit darker, maybe a bit colder. But it would just be another orbiting body of the same mass, so... Big whoop. I decided to go for a wonder, push the boundaries a bit. I expect I could walk around the entire perimeter of this hub if I wanted to. The beginning. What I really wanted to show off was how nice the devs are, giving you a ladder back here. Alternatively, how ingenious the robot they used to test the levels was, forcing the devs to put a ladder in here. It's about time I talked about this episode's logs. The first one is called Science Magic, and talks about soothsayers being evidence of science pre-Aristotle, and an anecdote about a palm reader who gave identical readings to two clients. It's not science on par with a robot inside a computer, inside an archive of all the world's knowledge, but it's still a science. Faith is getting a bit evangelical, and seems to have thrown in the towel. Just like with this ancient science, they've seen the increasing complexity these puzzles are getting, and have basically said, there's no way, it's impossible. Which is kind of where blind faith can lead you. It shouldn't need to be reiterated, but science and religion are not opposing forces. Trying to understand more about the universe should never be construed as spitting in the face of belief. This room has a very nice construction to it, having to sort everything out from over here. And even though my attempt at it follows the theme of this hub of me just kind of stumbling upon the solution, I can see it being quite tricky. That's not just me saying that. I attempted to point out there that the sigil was behind a barrier, so I'm going to have to reorganise these later. I was mainly just fortunate here, instead of trying to press on into that corner, I went through here instead, which gives you a much better perspective. The plan here is to stagger these mines so that I can weave between them. Again, after last episode, I'm willing to try anything with these things. So since I need to go all the way around the outside in order to get to the sigil, I only had to think about one route, and so by thinking about it carefully I could determine that any progress I made over in this corner would bring me ever closer to my goal. All that's left to do is set up the rest so I don't end up at the end having forgotten something. I even do some multitasking here, which is pretty swish. Some people will call it multi-failing, usually in a really smarmy voice, like, more like multi-failing but I can't help myself. Hey, the Greek. Would it hurt to respect your elders? That's quite a series of events, though. Faith determined that everything had become too complicated. Somehow managed to side with a serpent, which is the term it itself used for Milton, and as a result was completely terminated, not even spawning a new version of Faith. 
and all of this just doesn't faze me anymore. Faith's descendants were both sheep and samsara, so clearly whatever routine is responsible for choosing valuable traits thought they were on the right track. It's kind of odd sheep's response. I guess someone met their end here, considering the message refers to them. But we've already seen lots of versions of sheep. Whether the use name is just being reused... or different version numbers can be almost exactly the same, is not clear yet. I mean, it's fairly clear by now that version 99 is not a unique version. But maybe that's the highest it could go. Perhaps there are more version 99s than all the other versions combined. So, while Alexandra was talking, I saw a blue glow to the right of the tomb. Roughly 30 attempts of this later, I managed to smuggle a box up to the wall. I mean, I'd already had to pull off the tricky landing to find the telescope, and there were steps right here. This seemed perfectly logical. So, clearly I've missed something, but I've gotten this far. No one likes to be proven wrong. It's more fun to stick to your guns and try and shape the reality of the universe around you. Like an anti-vaccination proponent on an infinitesimally more trivial scale. Hush, Milton. I'll come to you later. There are three of these things in here. Seems like I should be able to get one of them out. Unfortunately, having a box would make things far easier. There's a kind of walkway over the purple barrier that seems almost intentional. In fact, there's another option to increase your movement speed, which would have made this a bit easier. But again, I thought this was intentional. A dozen tries later... I can't say I haven't been earning these bonus stars. So while I collect it, the second log is about weight loss, specifically how unnecessary it is when facing an apocalypse. I kind of want to ask what people would do if the end of the world was close at hand and irrefutable. I'm slightly worried too, but maybe that's unjustified. Yeah, I didn't think to look there. Screw it, found it anyway. Yeah, I think if you think about it a bit harder, most people at the end of the world would do slightly more than trying to have a lifetime's worth of orgasms compressed into the last few days on Earth. I'd probably stockpile stuff, grab the people closest to me, and just wander off to the most ridiculous place I could think of. theory, and it would need someone pulling the strings, but yeah, anything that can store memory would probably be bigger than your average planet. Really, I just want to goad him. No, that isn't what I said. Out loud. You probably can't hear me, and I don't know whether I can speak. Same old shortfalls. Ridiculous, I say. Do not think I know not the deceiver slithering through the hidden words. His wisdom is hollow and born of despair. Do not let him tangle you in his webs of delusion. Have faith in me and his petty illusions will fall away like nightmares in the morning's light. So, Milton's wondering how I can maintain my cognitive dissonance. I feel like I'm just trying to treat it as a grey area. 
And Elohim knows this is happening, but has a very limited perspective. Which makes sense, the Archive is a completely separate program, and the terminals are intended to be a single point of exposure to its interface. So the idea I've had, that one of the AIs might have spawned the other, is pretty unlikely, as they're following the original schema. There's even some chance that Elohim isn't an AI at all. That's got to be a depiction of embalming. Not sure what the birds are, though. So we've two voices vying for our attention. On the one hand, we're offered eternal life. On the other, hmm, perhaps we can persuade him to do that thing with the tin cans. I found most of B2's Easter eggs by myself, which I approve of. I almost found the one in B1 as well. You have to go through the middle window. And once again, circumnavigating the hub is well within your means. Hugging this wall so as not to be zapped away, and trying not to think about whether they could have programmed in an Oasis Mirage. Buried over here is maybe just the helmet of a serious Sam pilot, but really the opportunity for exploration is the true reward, up to the edge of the words of course. What I wouldn't give to be able to jump into the archive like in Tron. That's also an Inception reference. Tronception? I don't know. I've decided to play fast and loose with the definition of easter egg by showing off the actually intended solution to getting that star. While I'm doing that, I can talk about the third log entry. It's another one of Arcady's journals. He had a chat with Alexandra about the Talos Principle, Greek philosophy, and its relevance to the current situation. Out of all these, as he says, tens of thousands of files coming in every hour, the whole of human history, there's an awful lot about Greek philosophers. Avoiding metagaming, I wonder how Alexandra managed to have such a huge influence over what the Archive is showing us now. That alone makes it feel like it isn't chance, it's an attempt to construct a narrative flow for every version that passes through. I hope I see some messages from versions in the future that haven't bothered to look at any of the log entries, haven't discussed anything with Milton, are entirely focused on solving the puzzles and are wondering what the fuss is about. You know what, that could be us. I could not read anything, refuse to think or care about any of the wider issues aside from obsessively collecting these floating blocks, make their project backfire entirely. Or maybe that's what they're hoping for, to completely inundate me with all this information so that the only versions that make it through are the ones that ignore it all. If I'm supposed to be some sort of extension of human existence, I'll probably be more useful as a being that goes off and finds things, collects everything and then uses them to build walls and stuff, instead of spending all my time pondering the questions of the universe. But since I am doing all this thinking, I know that while my mind is free, my body is far from autonomous. I also found this by myself, just searched it on a whim. I don't know why I'm bothering to look these up. <sighs> and that was another serious Sam reference. I kid, I kid. Philip K. Dick. Androids do dream of electric sheep. And in my dreams, I naturally gravitated back towards the most beautiful spot. <laughs> 